here we are again. Welcome everyone to our uh, first in the series, our first professional development seminar for working artists. This one is entitled the Teaching Artist Practicum or the Distill Arts Method. You know, and one of the things that I want to just kind of say up front, there's nothing really special to the Distill Arts Method, to be honest with you. Uh, the approach that we take to teaching is based largely on the Socratic Method. But we're going to cover that. We're going to talk about that a bit more throughout today's session. And, um, you know, for our people watching this later on YouTube, uh, Distill Arts itself is a nonprofit arts mentorship organization that inspires, teaches, and hires emerging artists from underserved communities. Really, the point of Distill Arts existing is because we recognize that it's, it's important for artists such as ourselves to be given the tools that we need in order to effect change in our community, as well as, you know, to celebrate the, the various uh, cultural, you know, things that we bring to our community. The acronym in our name stands for Develop Skills and Transcend Limits Through the Arts. And that's basically what the purpose is of our Poet Artist Development Program, which is the program that is presenting this particular professional development session today. The Poet Artist Development Program is specifically for emerging artists ages 18 and older uh, who wish to essentially uh, create you know, the skills or establish some skills uh, that would help propel their career forward and also provides publishing opportunities. Um, again, like I said to those of you in attendance now, um, this particular session is part of the requirements for being a teaching artist intern uh, that would help us through our Creative Impact Program. The Creative Impact Program itself is kind of like an offshoot of the Poet Artist Development Program. And through the Creative Impact series, we currently are wrapping up the most recent edition of, of that series, which was Community Bridges. But every year through the Creative Impact series, we offer social justice focused workshops to the community that encourages them to submit artwork for potential publication. Uh, we also have our Concha y Café bilingual community writing workshops, uh, which are a 12 week series that happens three times a year and culminates in the publishing of a new zine called Concha y Café Zine. And we also produce art blog zine and artistic zine. Both of those zines are zines that collect work from the community. Artistic zine specifically is uh, looking at elevating the voices of individuals on the spectrum. So it's autistic artists specific. Whereas Art Blog Zine is open to all emerging artists residing in LA County and is also uh, going to be the revamped name to our uh, podcast, which we launched earlier this year. And to start us off, I'd like to actually begin with a quote. This quote comes from none other than Theodore Roosevelt, one of the presidents of the United States. And he is quoted as saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And of course, as is tradition with our workshops, I'd like to open it up to you, our participants. What does this particular quote mean to you? Feel free to just jump on in. Um, I'd like to say something or an, mm -hmm. uh, an after. Um, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, first of all, I want to say hi and apologize that I've been absent lately. And um, uh, I want to be real quick with that part um, to not take take up people's time. But um, I've been like really struggling with like extreme uh, Symptoms of ADHD, ADHD, attention deficit, like extreme, 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 well, almost like non-functional. But um, I just have to like have the courage to like um, conquer it or move through that. So I showed up even with a little anxiety and stuff, but I'm good. Other than that, I'm still, I'm blessed. I'm good and I'm glad to be here. Um, and that quote, um, the quote, um, I wrote it down because I use it a lot. I, I, mm. I am. Um, Let's see. It's if I got it right. It's people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. 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 Yeah. And I, I just use that. Uh, uh, so I was really moved when you said that. Touched. Because um, let's see. Um, 
a, f a couple of friends and I started an organization. It's a nonprofit. It's called Upward, and it it stands for it's this peace and social justice that changes the world, starting locally and thinking globally and uh, you know organization. So it's a peace and making our world a better place organization. Mm -hmm. It's tiny, but it's growing. It's called Upward, and it stands for Uniting Peace with Actions, Respect, and Dignity. And in the last couple of months, um, first of all, it shrinks and grows, and sometimes it's like almost non-existent on hiatus for a few months, and then it and then it grows again. So, um, but anyway, um, so uh, right now it's 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 growing. And um, a couple of months ago, a few people um, came in the organization. Uh, all I can say is they happen to be they happen to be communists, uh, and they happen to be yeah, um, interested in the organization and in world peace and social justice for everybody. Um, and um, I happen not to be communist. <laughs> um, I'm just like peace and love, um, native style, Native American ways, and traditions, mm -hmm. um, and forms of government. Anyway, um, but I'm about peace, peace and social justice. So um, anyway, that's just insight. But the, where the saying comes in is that um, they were upset that people weren't, um, um, they weren't receptive at all. And um, and then we even had a couple rallies uh, for peace in Ukraine and Russia um, and the world for world peace instead of like nuclear annihilation and instead of war in with Russia uh, and Ukraine um, peace. So and they were still surprised that what they said wasn't received well. And so I told them, look, man, uh, don't talk at people. Don't condescend to people or mm -hmm. but people don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. You talk from the heart and that's how you get people. You meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. So if they're Democrats, you don't, you know, just flush them down with, you know, fire hose them with communist stuff. No, you just make friends, make a friend. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, I think it's working a little, little by little. Excellent. And if that made any sense, but it, yeah, I think, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think the point came across, right. That, you know, I think the, the nature of the quote from what your understanding is, is that, yeah, you you build bridges and you don't burn them. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Do and Dr. You, Rosie. Yeah, you build bridges. Right. Uh, Dr. Rosie and then Mauricio. Go ahead, Dr. Rosie. Yes. Um, what, I, what I'm getting from this quote uh, is the fact that especially especially nowadays, you know, we, we all need to show respect, compassion, cariño, and dignity mm -hmm. for the other person. Uh, and, and that's how you show, you know, that's how they know that you care. And when they know that you care, then they're going to uh, care about what you know or what you can teach them mm -hmm. and, and learn from each other. That's what I got from it. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mauricio? I think Ooh, you're uh, breaking up there. I mean, just to add on to Dr. Rosie's statement, am I? I mean, I put it in the chat. I don't know how my connection to that all day, but uh, real quick. I think people will align and listen to you when you show that you're not just about yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, you say that you're, what you're doing and your goals and your actions are for kind of a greater good or like a comp, like something that Every like people are fighting for. Mm -hmm. I think that's when people will start to see and start to listen and you know show respect. But when you put the ego aside, essentially. Yeah, that's a good good way to put it. You know, um, and maybe even in a similar vein, I see Natalie wrote in the chat. When people know that what you're doing is important, they'll take it serious. Um, and I think that that comes from also just like a, a place of authenticity, right? Genuine concern or genuine uh, wanting to share what you have. Um, and I think that that's important. That's something that we uh, should really consider as we start to think about potentially teaching a workshop. You know, teaching is a practice. Teaching is in itself its own art form. So, you know, people are going to come at it from different different ways, different points of view. But one of the most important things that I would say is is crucial for planning is really understanding your audience. Before you plan a lesson or before you plan a workshop, it's really important, in my opinion, to assess what the community needs versus what is of interest to the community. You know, there are different things that, that people need in life and there are different things that actually attract them. 
in your experiences and especially in my experiences uh, as, as an instructor and as a learner, you know, I will attend a class if it's something that, you know, is, is of interest to me. But I'll also, you know, if I know or recognize that I need to learn a new skill, I will definitely attend a class for that because it's, it's a matter of my self-reflection. Um, it's, it's, it's a product of me knowing that, you know, I, I have inherent deficits in, in you know, my, my knowledge and in, in all of the things that I know. So, you know, skill acquisition versus skill development are going to be the different things that you'll see people uh, essentially wanting to to approach your workshop with. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. You know, a person that comes to, say, Conchas y Café, you know, they may already have a certain amount of writing experience, but, you know, they are maybe understanding that they want to not only develop their writing practice, but also learn some new techniques. Because in the end, that's what, you know, learning is about. It's about that, that skill development and picking up new things along the way. So, you know, there's, there's definitely things that you can look at in your community and you can recognize right off the bat. But also if you do like a, a community needs assessment, you know, if you take the time to do a survey beforehand, of the people that follow you on social media and also in a community center where you might want to conduct your workshops. You know, those are those are ways in which you can get feedback from people that maybe are looking for the development side of of, you know, acquiring a new skill and also people that want to just simply start from scratch. And then at that point, once you understand those different things, then you can also, you know, begin tailoring your lesson to the needs of the community. Um, also, people will attend things based on just their perception of art. Um, art as a hobby is a pretty, pretty common perception. Um, but there are people like us who are, you know, working artists and we look at it as as a form of personal development. You know, and it doesn't mean that people won't take their involvement in your workshop seriously. But, you know, the extent to which they want to develop themselves that is going to impact their commitment to learning. If your workshop for them is more of a hobby, you know, their participation might be a little more passive. You know, they might not show up to every single session, but, you know, they'll still be there because there's something of value to them, you know, being there. It's also really important to understand other things like the requirements for accessibility. You know, sometimes when we are planning workshops, uh, you know, at, here at Distill Arts, you know, we, we really do take into consideration the fact that almost everyone has, you know, a, a nine to five, you know, that is the average work schedule. And those that don't have your typical nine to five, you know, they make it work for them. They are here sometimes during a break or they'll watch the recordings later when they can, you know. And so all of those accessibility things are things that are also worth considering uh, when you begin planning a workshop. You know, location is also one of those things. You know, we recently had a workshop in down in Long Beach, just outside of downtown Long Beach, you know, and even though it was a drive for, for me to get there, you know, I can recognize that, you know, if a person that's living in the valley, for example, to get from the valley to Long Beach, you know, that's going to be that much more difficult. But if I recognize that and I do the job of, uh, you know, maybe uh creating a youtube video that someone can watch at a later date you know that does open up accessibility so thinking of those things and understanding the challenges that some people might encounter in approaching your workshop you know those are ways in which you can you can make it more accessible and to that point also things like language translation you know there are a lot of different forms of of uh learning but language, especially if you're teaching an arts workshop or even more importantly, a literary workshop, you know, language is probably a core part of that. And, you know, at a minimum, I would say consider translating your handouts if you are creating handouts or your marketing materials into the dominant languages of the people that you want to have attend your workshop. So if you know that you're trying to do a bilingual workshop, then, you know, your handouts should be uh, bilingual. Um, if it's going to be a monolingual workshop for a very specific group like Koreans, then obviously you would translate your handouts into Korean and so on and so on. 
Uh, but that also means too thinking about you know auditory needs, you know people that use uh, you know other other forms of of communication. Um, assistive technologies are things that are expensive, but if you strategically partner with some place like a public library, they actually have access to that that type of um, technology. You know the specialized keyboards for visually impaired people. You know the auditory uh, like speakers for. Um, for people with auditory needs, like those, those are other forms of assistive technologies that you don't necessarily have to provide. But if you're strategic in choosing your location, you know, those are things that, that can be provided on your behalf, which does tie in again with the technical requirements. You know, with the pandemic hitting us hard, you know, everything went to a digital platform which meant that a lot of people with limited access to the internet, you know, weren't able to continue in our programs. But, you know, once we were able to figure out how to make it more accessible, you know, through Google Meet, by offering our mobile art lab and the mobile hotspot that, that it's able to provide, you know, there's certain things that, that on our side we were able to do. But you can also, you know, encourage people to uh, actually from the LA Public Library system, check out MyFi's and tablets that they can take home and use for up to three months. And, you know, that will be a way for people to meet the basic technical requirements if you decide to conduct a workshop online. Also, it's important to understand your goals, right? Your personal goals, your motivations. You know, are you conducting a workshop as art for art's sake? Or are you approaching your art and, you know, the lesson that you hope to teach as a vehicle for empowerment. You know, it's not like people are gonna not attend your lesson because it's one over the other. That's, that has nothing to do with, with people's attendance. But, you know, if people are maybe doing it maybe more for, uh, you know, a day out with their children, you know, that's maybe more art for art's sake. So, you know, if your workshop is gonna be tailored for all ages, you know, that might be a way in which people will sort of commit to the learning. Whereas if you're doing it as a vehicle for empowerment, you know, we're probably going to be seeing a different kind of crowd, a crowd that is maybe committed to the learning in a very different way. And then, you know, a family might be committed to their learning. So, you know, as you plan your workshop, it's also good to be transparent about your intentions and the outcome of their involvement. With Distill Arts, for example, we always make it very clear that People that attend our workshops have the opportunity to have their work published. And we're trying to focus on, you know, topics that are relevant to our community in one way or another. And so by being open about that in our marketing, you know, we're, we're essentially signaling to people that this is going to be an experience that could lead to more if they choose. And it's also good to understand your personal investment in learning, you know, Planning a lesson doesn't mean just simply putting together a couple of things and, you know, finding a poem that you want to analyze and let's go. You know, it's not necessarily as simple as that. It also does require a little bit of research. It requires an understanding of your own learning experience. Um, and it requires understanding your audience, you know, and what their personal connection to the material might be. It's really difficult for someone to make connections if they don't feel personally invested. So, you know, your your personal investment in whatever it is that you're trying to teach is hopefully going to come through when you are teaching it. And that will also help create an environment where people just want to be there and learn from you. It's also really important to remember that academic language is not the same as accessible language. I was talking with Ma with uh, Abraham a little bit earlier today, and I was giving him an example of like a person that is maybe, you know, trying to explain socialism to, you know, another person that's never heard of it before, a blue collar worker, right? Somebody that maybe didn't have the benefit of going to, to uh, a college class on political science. So if you're using academic jargon, words that are very specific to the topic without defining them or anything, you know, you're, you might end up losing people. They might not really get to understand all of the impact of what you're saying. But it's also at the same time important to remember that you should never yeah. underestimate people's ability to understand complex concepts. You know, my dad, 
he only had two years of formal schooling, but you know, in Mexico, he, he was able to, to still get by. And to this day, he's probably one of the most mathematically aware people that I've ever met. I mean, he could tell you how to mix fertilizer with water, you know, in proper ratios without, you know, creating poison for, for the environment. And that's with him only knowing how to do basic adding, subtracting, division, and multiplication. You know, so my dad understands very complex concepts, but maybe doesn't have the language to express them. And again, you know, it's it's really valuable to, as it says right here, work within the experiences of the community to communicate a concept. I think, again, the most personal way in which a person can engage with learning is by using their individual experiences or an experience that is even your own experience to communicate how a concept, you know, has impacted you. And, you know, that's something that with time, you know, you you will kind of start to make those connections. But but for sure, you know, it, it helps to just simply understand your goals in learning and teaching. So one last quote here before we move on. And this comes from Socrates. I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. What does this mean to you? I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. Ooh, I already hear some hands. Uh, let's see, it looks like Mauricio first and then Tina. I think teaching is a two-way street. So much as you are willing to teach, your student has to be willing to learn as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what Socrates was trying to say with this is that, you know, he can make you think certain concepts, but if you're not, if your if your glass is full per se, then well, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, Tina, and then I see a hand from Miss Lois. Tina, I guess um, that's kind of my goal. I, more than anything, I would like people to think. You know, even if they're thinking funny or if they're thinking logical, mm -hmm. that's that's all I want people to do. And since I'm becoming a teacher, I do want people, I do want children to think a little bit, you know, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The end. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tina. And Miss Lois. Good evening, everyone. Good to see your face. Um, there's an old cliche that says, you can lead a, a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing. And I think somebody just said it. Um, they have to have a desire within themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, ultimately, I think people, because they want to learn, they will come to your workshop. You know, that that's always going to be important. I think secondarily is them being aware that you're even offering the workshop. You know, that's where marketing and you know, doing that outreach does does play a big role. But when it comes to the actual lesson, you know, sometimes things build up over, over time. Um, to give you a quick little example, when we first started providing the Conchas y Café workshops to the community, Conchas y Café had, I believe it was only five people in attendance. Like our very first session had only five people. By the time that the second week came around, we had grown to about eight people. By the end of that year, after that first year of Conchas y Café being offered at the East LA Library, we had grown to approximately 20 participants. And at our biggest, we had about 25 people um, attending every week, every Tuesday. And that was that was pretty amazing. You know, it took a little bit of time, but but definitely it was something that that we saw that people were reacting to, right? When people learned that there was a free workshop for adults in their community, you know, they, they started to come to us. Um, and all we had to do was just be there, essentially. You know, sometimes when you when you are thinking about your audience, you know, you may not necessarily be 100% sure if what you're offering is going to have an impact. But, you know, that is kind of where Again, doing a little bit of research, a little bit of that that sort of market research, right, will will really help you understand where to go, and and what to do in order to get things to to really uh, 
have an impact on the community. Um, let's see. Ani writes, I see Socrates' idea that his job is to open your mind to learning and taking in new ideas, asking questions. That's where the learning happens. Right, exactly. And Karen wrote, I think with Socrates, the ideas are already inside of you. The teacher is there to draw them out. Yes, I definitely agree with that one. That's always been personally my approach. You know, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I may have been doing this for a long time, but in no way do I consider myself a, a complete expert in everything that we're teaching. So, um, yeah, ultimately it is, it is, you know, the teacher's role to uh, just present ideas and, you know, let people kind of come to their own, to their own realization that this was always inside of them to begin with. So, um, does anyone have any questions so far? I feel like I've covered a, a lot. No? I do. Yes, Ms. Lois. Uh, when we're speaking about community, um, I'm thinking uh, it could be a congregation, a classroom, a group of people, a gathering. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that, that means the uh, uh, same page. Yeah. You're the same page. Yeah, your community is your audience, right? It's okay. it's whoever it is that, that you intend to, to teach. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Mauricio? Accessible language. Hmm. Sorry, you, you broke up there, Mauricio. I'm not sure if... Maybe turning I'm gonna, off. I'm going to type it. Okay. I'll just type it out. All right. So, any other questions in the meantime? No? All right. So, we'll just wait there for Mauricio to finish typing his question. But again, you know, I think one of the things that I, I want to maybe at least anticipate from Mauricio's question about accessible language. You know, accessible language is not necessarily dumbing things down, right? You're not gonna dumb things down because you don't think that people can understand a concept. What you want to do is make it relatable, right? Accessible language is about making things relatable to them. So if you are, say, I don't know, uh, in terms of accessible academic language, what would the case be for teaching in an academia setting, like geared for a college or high school setting? Um, that's a really good question. And the way that I would answer that question is to say, one, if you know that your audience is already at a particular level where they know the definitions to specific jargon, you know, if a person is in, let's say, a creative writing workshop at a university level, um, specifically at an MFA level, which is the highest level that you can, you know, achieve in, in creative writing, you know, then you would definitely expect them to already know things like enjambment or, um, you know, a sejura. Uh, you would expect them to be already prepared with the basic awareness of certain vocabulary words, ultimately. Now, you can't make that assumption in all community spaces. Therefore, you would want to just simply come prepared with those definitions. It comes down to creating a common language that you can all share. Um, and it's also, again, not so much about making academic language remain in academia, because that's not true, right? Any person, if they're given the tools to understand, they will understand academic language. You know, I've I've taught multiple times things like enjambment um, or, uh, I don't know, prosody, uh, you know, like very specific terms that are related to writing in community settings where people have never even written a poem before. And, you know, it wasn't about breaking down what the concept means. It was about making the concept relatable. Um, you know, something like anaphora you know, when you speak of an Afro, you can always use like a song 
as, as an example. You know, a very common popular song can be a way for you to describe anaphora. Um, you know, so, so it's about, again, recognizing the experiences of your audience and using that to help create a common sense of understanding, a common language. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, Natalie writes, I like what you said about accessible language. Sometimes people think poetry is beyond them because some people write it with such abstract concepts that it doesn't reach them, right? And Mauricio wrote, agreed, sometimes the poetic language is intentionally used as a gatekeeper of sorts. Exactly. We're not here to gatekeep. You know, we're here simply to provide people with tools for understanding. Uh, Ms. Lois, I see you raised your hand as well. Well, I was going to say, what it, all, all that you said was very true. And, uh, but if you're going to do like uh, in a lecture or something, uh, and, and you you know, like you say, it's the first day, you know, hey, I'm your professor, my name is blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And you don't get a chance to um, know your, your pupil. Uh, you can ask uh, questions to involve them into the session. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as a minister, we always was taught that when you uh, say something, you and it's a, um, how do you say, a topic or a uh, definition, you uh, repeat it. Mm -hmm. And then you get, like you say, give an, an example. Right, right. Yeah, and that I think actually ties in very well with where we're going next. So let's head back over to our slideshow here. Um, and let's talk about the workshop structure, right? So like I said, this is the distill arts method. And to be completely honest with you all, I don't think that there's anything very special about our workshop structure. Um, it's probably the most common workshop structure that you might come across. Of course, the way in which people execute it, that does change. And, you know, parts of this are, are based on what's called the Socratic method, which is, you know, where you provide a space for people to come to their own conclusions. The basic workshop structure that we typically follow in all of our workshops is we open up with an icebreaker. And the icebreaker is meant to be a universal activity that one, establishes rapport, and two, creates a safe environment. You know, you, you want people to always feel like they can speak their mind and not feel like they're doing things wrong or saying things wrong. Um, because way too often, that's our experience in education. You know, I, I can guarantee you that all of us at one point or another have had an experience in a very formal school setting where we were told, no, you're wrong, stop. And you know, that, that breaks a person's spirit right away. So the purpose of the icebreaker is to have discussion. It's to allow people the space to feel comfortable saying what's on their mind. And, you know, to feel open to having, you know, their questions answered if they have questions. It's also a good opportunity to front load a workshop. And what I mean by front loading a workshop is if you know that by the end of the workshop session, you want people to walk away with a complete poem, then, you know, the icebreaker is a good opportunity to have a either group activity or an individual activity where they start actually preparing for the final outcome. Typically after the icebreaker, you know, after that initial quote or activity, you know, then we'll introduce the concepts, you know, you'll, you'll provide definitions for different tools or strategies, and you'll also be providing a sort of historical context. Historical or cultural context are great ways to get people to really see how they themselves fit into the development of this particular tool or strategy. I think the first time that I ever introduced the concept of the floricanto into our workshops, uh, you know, I had a couple of people afterwards tell me that they had no idea that Mesoamerican poetry existed. They had only thought that floricanto meant like songs, but they weren't aware that, you know, their ancestors were poets and artists and had so much more cultural richness to, to, to you know, their, their lives. Um, so providing that bit of historical and cultural context is, is very meaningful in a lot of different ways. The same goes with the sample 
through most of the workshops, we will always be providing samples of either writing or artwork that actually use the strategy that we're trying to teach or the tool that we're trying to teach. It's just a great way for people to visualize the tool in action. And again, you know, just reinforces what you're trying to, to convey. And there's always time for some sort of creative exercise, you know, whether it be as a homework assignment or, or not, that's kind of going to depend on the amount of time that you have and also the space in which you're working in, but a creative exercise, some sort of prompt or, you know, some sort of, uh, like activity at the very end is always a great way to to end off your sessions along with if possible group sharing you know if you allow the time for people to share what they've come up with you know it gives them a chance to ask questions but it's also a way for you to praise them to for you to celebrate their accomplishments up to that point you know and to provide that additional bit of encouragement into their you know ultimate arts practice because let's face it all of us need encouragement. Now, uh, to go a little bit deeper into what makes a good icebreaker um, effective is really thinking strategically and understanding that the purpose of it is to engage critical thinking and encourage participation. You know, those two things, when they when they happen simultaneously, those are going to be the things that, that will get people that much more invested in their learning. If you do it right away, you're going to really get them excited about whatever is coming next. That's why most of the time in our workshops, we've, we've typically done the quote analysis. You know, for those of you that have been around long enough, you've seen this and have actually seen it introduced. Because when I first started teaching Concha y Café, we didn't actually do quote analysis. Abraham actually, a couple of years ago, uh, or last year, pointed it out to me that, you know, it was maybe the second year of offering Conchas y Café, that all of a sudden the quote analysis came to be part of it. The quote analysis, at least for me and my experience, you know, if it's related to the, to the general topic of whatever it is that you're going to be teaching, it helps people begin to understand their relationship with art, history, and their larger community. And I personally like to, to look for quotes that come from different places in the world. You know, I've brought in quotes from uh, Mesoamerican poets, um, poets that are from uh, Europe, Asian poets, African poets, like basically any part of the world where people write, you know, I've, I've brought something. And that's just a good way to show, you know, that, that we live in a community, a larger global community of, of artists. Um, I've also conducted brainstorming activities where you, you know, basically are encouraging your learners to begin the, the process of, of the creative exercise that's going to come later in the workshop. Sometimes you can mask it as like a, you know, an activity of like, oh, you know, let's, let's read this and then, you know, pick out some words that stand out to you. And then at the very end, you know, the final prompt might be, okay, now use those words that you created at the very beginning to now construct a poem. So that way they already have something that they're prepared with um, and don't have to be essentially struggling at the very end. Another thing about a good icebreaker is that you'll be able to see the class dynamics through that. As long as people are participating, you'll see who's maybe a little bit more shy, who's a little bit more reserved, and who's more outspoken and is going to be the one that you can typically rely on to engage with. You know, that's, that's also a good way for you to kind of adjust your teaching style if you need to. You know, I, I did say at the beginning, you know, teaching is, a, is an art form. It's a practice. It's something that you develop over time. But the more observant you are of your audience, of your participants, the you know more naturally you're going to want to tailor the things that you're saying to them. The more you're going to be actively thinking about the ways in which you are constructing your sentences, um, and ultimately you know trying to be as as communicative as possible with with your lesson. Uh, it's also a good a good space to guide conversation. You know. Sometimes people will kind of go off on tangents because, you know, they, that's what we do. Uh, but if you can find a way to bring it back to the core lesson, that's going to be a skill that will really help you push your, for, your, uh, your workshops forward. It's also, you know, when it comes to creating a safe space, this is also the perfect opportunity to remember that there are no absolutes in art. 
a lot of times people will have certain ideas about what is good art and what is bad art. My argument against that would be that there is no such thing as a right or wrong way to write a poem. There's no such thing as good or bad art. Everything is subjective. The only thing that exists is effective art or ineffective art. But effective art is art that communicates a message, an emotion, or an idea to its audience. If those things are happening in a piece of art, even if a person doesn't like it and is having a negative reaction to it, it's still effectively communicating something. And that's a good good opportunity for you at the very beginning to, to you know, again, create that safe space by really acknowledging those things with people. Um, especially if you start off with something as simple as a quote that you're analyzing. I heard a hand. Ms. Lois? I was going to ask that uh, you were talking about, um, how do you say, relaying a message with the uh, art. It would that be something similar to the comic book we did? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's one way to, uh, you know, put messages in your artwork, for sure, if that's what you mean. It is. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see. Are there questions in the chat that I've missed? The question is, a writer, how accessible you want to be? Well, I guess that's a rhetorical question from Abraham. Um and students with his comprehension is an example of a unique audience. Yeah, yeah, you know, depending on, on you know, different uh, learning capacities that people have, you know, that's also a way for you to tailor your, your lessons. Um, and Mauricio writes, I've always appreciated the diversity of authors and writers we start the classes with. Yes, thank you, Mauricio. All right, any questions so far? No. All right, let's continue on. All right, so that's the icebreaker, right? The, the benefits of having an effective icebreaker. Um, the setup portion is going to be when you start to establish those definitions, right? Like I said earlier, this is an opportunity for you to establish a common language with people. You know, if you're teaching a new skill or if you're helping people develop a skill that they already are coming with, you know, it's really important that you establish a common language that you're going to be using. And so, you know, when you're doing that, it helps to sometimes bring in not just the definition of, say, metaphor, but, you know, because metaphors exist simultaneously with things like similes, you know, you also will likely want to define that ancillary term, right? A simile is just like a metaphor, except it uses the words like or as in those comparisons. You might also want to say the antonym to something, you know, the opposite of it. Um, that way people can understand the, 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 the difference between the opposing concepts. Um, and sometimes it's also a good space for you to address certain misconceptions, you know, because sometimes somebody might have heard something that they kind of, you know, maybe sort of halfway understood, but they didn't never really, you know, understand fully what, like, say, a line break is and why a line break is important. So that could be another opportunity for you in defining the language that you're using, you know, to, to sort of help clarify misconceptions. But as always, don't dumb it down. More than, more than anything, just remember that people have the capacity to understand complex things. We all do. It's just a matter of making it relatable. You know, you can still use academic language, but use it in a way that is relatable. And that does go back to the idea of show, don't tell right? Visuals obviously help, right? They're, you know, people commonly know or have heard of the three different learning strategies or learning methods, the auditory, the visual, and the kinesthetic. You know, those things might be true. They, you know, might not necessarily be true, but visuals do help. However, don't rely on that. You know, you might find yourself teaching in a space where you don't have access to a whiteboard or you don't have the ability to print large images for people to you know be able to look at if you're talking about a visual piece of art and especially if you're talking about a specific strategy or a concept like psychoanalytic theory you know psychoanalytic theory itself doesn't have a visual equivalent to it 
But you could definitely talk about a real life experience that a person has had, you know, with psychoanalytic theory. Uh, you can use things like, you know, the way that a person might be conducting a crowd on a stage to talk about the id, the ego, and the superego, right? And the different choices that a person on a, on a stage would be making. The show don't tell also does apply to something like the historical and cultural context. You know, especially with our Creative Impact series, we really use this concept here, the continuity and change concept, to trace a line through history. Ultimately, when you use history to sort of guide people's understanding of the formation of a tool and why a tool exists now, you know, people are going to really be able to make those connections, especially if you're using history and you're saying, uh, let's say, for example, in uh, ancient Japan, you know, the, the haiku began because you had samurai that ultimately were part of this extended period of peace during the Edo era, you know, and once the nation was unified after the feudal era, you know, you had samurai who now had time to actually sit and think about philosophy and life and poetry and haiku became one of the ways in which they started to express those those thoughts in relation to nature, life, and death. You know, and when people sort of learn that little bit of history and that origin story for something, all of a sudden their understanding is going to change, right? The more they understand that things, you know, exist within history, within a cultural context, the more they're going to be like, oh, wow, you know, that, that's a really cool way for me to, to enter into this new world of art and poetry. And again, you know, whenever possible, acknowledge the learner's place within this history. You know, like I said before, when I first introduced the concept of floricanto into our workshops, afterwards I had somebody come up to me and say, I didn't realize that floricanto actually had a Nahuatl name and that it existed well before people started using it in the 60s to talk about baile folklorico, basically. And, you know, that's that's something that when people start to recognize themselves in the artwork that you're presenting, you know, that it, it really does then become more about empowerment at that point, whether you were anticipating that or not. When it comes to the samples that you bring in, always, as much as you can, reinforce the practice of the concept tool or strategy you know if you're going to teach a lesson that is focused on metaphors and how to write an effective metaphor then make sure you bring a poem that shows an effective metaphor in action that's really going to be the best way for people to kind of grasp the concept um, and again remember where possible find samples that most closely reflect the community of learners you know if you're going to be teaching a lesson that is centered on black arts, right? Like Miss Michelle did, uh, you're gonna wanna have samples of art created by black artists during the black arts movement era. If you don't have that, then really the the reason for teaching that lesson is kind of kind of moot. There's really no point in teaching that. Um, and then of course, at the very end, you're gonna put it into practice. You know, everything ultimately becomes homework, you know, and whether you choose to do something during the class, if you want people to complete a poem during the lesson, you know, that's great. But really, I think you should always strive to get people to the point where they feel well equipped to go off and practice this on their own. It's kind of like what Miss Lois was saying earlier. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't teach him to drink. You know, but if you can, or, or there's the other one, the uh, parable of the man that learned how to fish, right? You teach a man to fish, he will feed himself for life. You know, that's kind of the idea. You want to be basically always aiming for the goal of people walking away and feeling comfortable with what they just learned and being able to use it in their own life. And this is true whether you're teaching art or teaching accounting. You know, you just, you want people to feel comfortable and prepared enough to be able to go off and do things on their own. Even if they have to come back to you for a little refresher or with questions, try to get them to that point where they feel empowered to take this and essentially turn around and teach it themselves. Uh, I heard a question. Yes, Miss Lois. I was gonna say, you took the words out of my mouth. 
um, in Bilen, uh, how you say, working with the Toastmasters, um, my son, who supports me, uh, I invited him, and um, they asked him would he like to get up and say something, and he was so shy and nervous, and he goes, Mom, what should I say? And so I says, just tell him, you know, give him your name and what you like, and uh, tell him a short story. So when he got up there, uh, he told, you know, he introduced himself and everything. And uh, then he told him about something that he and his grandfather had experienced together. Mm -hmm. And they were like, uh, you know, how do you say, um, encouraging him, you know, saying, yeah, you know, because they had similar experiences. And he started smiling and feeling good. And uh, when he got out, you know, when it was over, he felt encouraged. He said, that was good. He says, because I never spoke it before, you know, in front of somebody. Hmm. And so um, what, what would you say to make them feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it makes a great impact. And mm -hmm. then they'll walk out, uh, how do you say, feeling good to go even further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, like I was saying earlier, you know, sometimes your goal may not necessarily be empowerment, but people, when they're learning... And if they feel like they really genuinely learned something that they can use, they're going to walk away feeling empowered no matter what. And that's, I think, the most fruitful thing of, of teaching, you know, is being able to see that, being able to see people walk away with something new that they can then apply to their own life. Um, and like you were saying earlier mm -hmm. uh, about some people think um, poetry is about songs or something. I think you mm -hmm. said um, I did a workshop um, on poetry with, oh, with some other people. I went by myself. And this man brought his children in there, and I was trying to explain to them about poetry. And it's like, ugh, ah, you know, long hair stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I told him, I said, you like rap? And he says, yeah. I said, that's just poetry set the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. you personalized it, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I think that... Um, you know, and then maybe like, you know, what Lynette is observing in, in the chat about, I'm assuming this was in relation to the samurai developing haiku, you know, and how Hawaiians, native Hawaiians develop their own beautiful forms of art. When a person is given the, the opportunity to reflect, right, given the space to feel comfortable with reflecting, self-reflecting, they're going to come up with amazing things, more so because they ultimately learned how to apply it to their own life, you know. And you as an instructor, your role is really kind of like what we were saying before, to draw it out of them because that's always been in people. You know, their individual experiences are valid. Their individual experiences are what have taught them, you know, already. So it's, it's more about making connections for people in their minds than anything else. Right. And the way in which you structure your lesson can help with that. So to put that into practice, last year I created this template and it seems to have worked pretty well for everyone. This template right here will be made available to you all through Google Classroom, along with the recording and this slide deck as well. And it'll be especially useful for those of you that want to be teaching artist interns this upcoming year. The upper half of the of the um, template itself is basically where you begin with assessing your audience and you develop your outcomes. Right. You'll see there's, you know, the skill or concept to be taught. You know, that's where you'll fill in what you think people should walk away with, what they will learn. Um, the workshop outcome is whatever they're, they're going to produce, whether it's a poem, a, a drawing, an illustration, uh, a collage. You know, there's all sorts of different things that could be the potential outcome. That would be more like the physical product. But you'll notice that, you know, there is a section that says different, that has different age groups. And when you really think about your audience and you're assessing your audience, you know, that's going to impact what your outcome is and also how complex of a lesson you will have. Um, the historical context might change partly because you're teaching to an elementary age audience, you know, um, whereas if you're working with seniors, you know, the historical context might be a bit broader. Uh, it all is going to depend on who you anticipate your audience being.
And it's also going to be kind of like your opportunity to answer the why, why your audience should be interested or engaged in learning to begin with. You know, it's, it's a way for you to already anticipate, you know, people's maybe like skepticism as to wanting to attend. You know, if you approach it from, from the viewpoint of, you know, this is something that, that actually happened in your community, you know, this come, come and learn about it and what you can do about it you know, then you're, you're going to have a different approach overall to teaching your lesson. And again, you know, the historical context, um, especially for those of you that want to be teaching artist interns this year, uh, this is going to be based largely on what the theme is for the Creative Impact series, uh, which we will go over after this, this particular slide deck. The lower half is going to just simply help you begin structuring your workshop. You have the opportunity to check whether you're doing a quote, a brainstorming activity, or a group activity, and you can start, you know, filling it in now. Uh, it's always good to have your notes kind of centralized, and, you know, this, this template seems to have worked that way for, for those of you that already did your lessons for the Community Bridges series. And then also the samples of art or literature. You know, find samples that reinforce the skills being taught. And again, when possible, find something that reflects your audience. You know, if it's going to be a predominantly Latino audience, then, you know, try to find a poem that's made by a Latino writer. Uh, if you think it's going to be a fairly diverse audience, you know, of, of multiple ethnicities, then try to find something that, you know, maybe is going to throw people and, and make them not realize that, you know, they're the the form of writing is practiced by, I don't know, somebody completely outside of their community. So that's that's the purpose of this template here. And um, before we move on, I actually wanted to uh, give actually Mauricio an opportunity to speak a little bit about his experience with teaching his workshop. You know, I definitely want to shout out Mauricio for the, the job that he did this past week um, because his lesson was a pretty large one. Um, you know, when we first started planning it, you know, Mauricio had a lot of good ideas, but I was very impressed with how Mauricio was able to really narrow it down and, uh, you know, ultimately be an effective teacher. So Mauricio, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how the template helped you and, you know, what your thought process was as you developed your lesson this week? Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. We can hear you. Um, it was a lot of fun. I will say that in the beginning, it did seem very daunting just because, as Louise mentioned, there was a lot of material and um, how to do it. So I think what helped me the most was kind of, well, one, doing the research. Um, I had a lot of research. I had found a book on the topic itself. So I spent like a good amount of time reading through it, taking notes. Um, seeing what would be the most effective way to teach the lesson. So I think the first like you know, hot tip would be just like know, know your content, like know what it is you're studying. Even if you don't have, say, like your sheet in front of you, you at least know which direction you're going to. You know, you know your 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 subject. And sorry, then like Mauricio, I think real, what I was real quick, really trying to do. Yeah. Sorry, Mauricio, not to cut you off, but um, you're okay. you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, maybe okay. if you turn off your camera, that might help. Okay. Yeah. Let me know how that works. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I also, um, I'm not sure so, if everyone is aware of what your topic was. Do you mind sharing with the group what your topic was? Yeah, for sure. So the topic was the uh, United Farm Workers Move, and it was connecting that to folklore poetry and um, basically creating yourself as a hero in your own story and using poetry for that. Yeah. I'm stop and go. Do you guys hear me? Okay. <laughs> My connection's been horrible all day. Uh -huh. okay. It yeah. cut in and out, but did you say... To be a hero in your own story. Did you say the word hero or what? Yes. Word you... Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Hero. And um, also, I think what helped as well was just being able to have a conversation. You know, like I, I tried the best, my best, the uh, forefronts of it. I'm sorry, Mauricio. Your, your connection is that? definitely dipping in and out. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, guys. I'll try to write everything out. How about that? <laughs> Okay, yeah, if, if that'll work. I also wanted to shout out Gustavo, too. Um, of all the workshops that were offered, Gustavo's was the, uh, had the largest attendance. Gustavo had about 27 people 
Um, it was so much so that the staff at the Barnes and Noble um, started to kind of panic a little bit because they didn't have enough tables and chairs. Um, so, you know, to speak a little bit to how you were able to get so many people to come through, Gustavo, could you share with us maybe what strategies you used to have such a large turnout? Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, it's uh, off the cuff, of course. Uh, um, I didn't know you were going to ask that, obviously. So um, so I have to dig deep into my brain and my heart right now. And um, <laughs> I just, I call it a in a funny way, I, I call it a good crazy. Like I went crazy just inviting, you know, like I just, I just went, um, uh, I guess it's called, um, with, you know, some motivators like say Tony Robbins, <laughs> um, Anthony Robbins, that motivator, um, motivational speaker, so-called or whatever, um, says, all, uh, I think he says like, go for, um, for success in life. You go for, um, all out massive action. And without really thinking that I was, you know, I, I didn't really think of those in those words, but I, but I, that's what I did. I just went all out massive action and I just used every form like in person, especially Facebook. And I kept on reminding people and um, saying how excited I was. And then some days, cause remember how I, I struggle with, um, with symptoms of mental illness and a diagnosis. And, um, uh, and so sometimes I go into deep depression. So, um, in that deep depression, I was thinking, oh, my God, I can't even do this. I might have to cancel. But then I would always think, of course, like cancel the whole thing. Um, like even as recent as close to as like three or four days before the, the uh, event, believe it or not, um, I was in my heart. I was like, I, I didn't know that I could pull it off. And I was thinking I'd have to cancel. So what I believed in then is, of course, what I believe right now is the show must go on. There is no such thing as canceling. People are going to show up no matter what. They will show up, even if I don't show up. And if I stopped inviting, and even if I uninvited people, people will show up, you know, because of flyers or something. Um, not everyone will get the cancellation notice and people will show up. So, um, um, uh, but it went, I think it went really, really, really well. Um, uh and I showed my enthusiasm and it came out maybe a little nervous at the beginning or I'm all, I'm usually nervous these days in a crowd of two people, I get self-conscious. So, um, but we just worked through that. It was, I mean, I don't know if it was apparent or not, but um, even if it was, it's like, it's okay. Cause uh, I guess I was super motivated in, in person. And I, and I believe that what you said, I, I think I hopefully taught from that is like exactly that people don't care about how much, you know, but they do want to know how much you care. And so, and you can't fake that. You can't not fake that. You can't like have an ulterior motive uh, of, I don't know, just wanting 200 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and, you know, um, like uh, that can't be your first motive. I mean, yeah, I want the 200 bucks. I cash the check. Yes, thank you. And that is one of the reasons actually. So um, actually it is, but, um, but I have to care about people. I want to change. I want to save the world. I want to bring peace to our communities. So um, yeah. that's what I, that's what my goal is, is, and I, I want to, I truly honestly want to connect with people. Like I love them. Like in that hour, they're like, as if they were my kids, they might've been 40 or 50 years old or 30 or 19. Mm -hmm. But like when I taught, they were like my kids. I don't have kids, but they were like my, or my little cousins, my little Solvinos. And even though they're 60, like, I love them like that. Like, you know, like, and it's true. It's just, it might seem weird. Like I just know them, but in that it's like a responsibility to teach. You have to love them or else don't, if, or else get another job. <laughs> I think that, that, yeah, and that, that's a great sentiment. Um, thank you for sharing that Gustavo. And I, I definitely appreciate the fact that you, that you brought up that you were very consistent in sharing, not only on Facebook, but also in person and also um, sharing your enthusiasm about the, the prospect of teaching, um, because that definitely was reflected, I think, in the attendance. Um, to speak a little bit to, to the workshops themselves moving forward with everyone for this upcoming year, you know, Distill Arts will be helping you with creating the flyers. Um, you know, we're going to help you with crafting the handouts and uh, doing translation of the handouts and, and all of that. Uh, but, you know, there's only so much that we're able to do in terms of the marketing, 
you know, it, it's our community is, is our community, but our community in combination with your community, you know, having that overlapping message of the workshop, you know, is going to improve attendance no matter what. And so, you know, that is one thing that uh, that I do want to make sure that that is pretty clear. We'll help and we'll create the flyers, um, but it's it's ultimately going to be on you as teaching artist interns to continue the the process of marketing to help spread the word and to to uh, make those those one on one connections that sometimes are necessary to get people to come to your workshop. Um, Ms. Lois, how do you acquire the space? Uh, that's going to be also partly on you. So if you end up becoming a teaching artist intern with us, it'll be, uh, you know, a community space, hopefully that you have a connection with already. Um, if not, you know, you can obviously approach a community space like Mojde did. Uh, Mojde got the um, Fowler Museum at UCLA campus. And, you know, that was a really cool workshop, I thought. Um, even though we didn't have very high attendance, you know, the fact that the space was offered to us for free um, because it was open to the community, that was that was pretty, pretty incredible. Um, of course, workshops are always welcomed at local libraries, too. Um, with COVID, you know, they are finally starting to open up to the community. But um, this past year, it was a little bit more difficult. However, that said, we also offer the mobile art lab as a venue for you to be able to teach a workshop. Just find a park, find a parking space for us, you know, and if we're able to spread out with some tables, you know, get five people to come through and that's a workshop. Uh, the, the, um, my thing is that um, I started a junior Toastmasters mm -hmm. uh, helping to develop the children's, um, how do you say, public speaking, mm -hmm. and as well as um, teaching them, uh, you know, classroom work as well. But I started out with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And then at a private school, I um, was a mentor, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, the teacher there wanted to start a Toastmasters because I was in Toastmasters and he was as well. And so I wanted to combine this. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking... Can it be with children or does it have to be adults? You know, this is my first night. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions I have. Yeah, I'll actually answer some of those questions uh, momentarily. But um, but this is also specific to those that are going to be teaching a workshop under our Creative Impact series, um, which this year is going to be called Decent Living. Um, so I'll get more into that. Uh, but, you know, if you are interested in teaching anything else, you know, some of these these same techniques would, would apply. So oh, I, under, I, I understanding what you just your... Said. What was that um, topic again? Decent living. That's going to be the name of the series. Oh, yeah, I can handle that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, just to make sure that we don't go over time too much, um, I'm, I would like to read for everyone what Mauricio wrote. Um, basically, some strategies about Mauricio's workshop. Know your material. I spent a lot of time reading and understanding the content so I could teach, teach it in my own words. Number two, narrowing down. I spent a lot of time going through what content would be best for the audience. So I looked into what the audience would get the most slash the most relevant information plus the most value in the most concise way. Number three, have a conversation. Try to make the workshop as open-ended as you can without swaying too far from the material, but making it a conversation. Having a connection with the audience by giving them the space to analyze and understand the content in their own way helps tremendously. And number four, reach out individually to others, not just sharing on Instagram or Facebook. Sometimes people are more receptive if you send them a direct message that isn't a copy-pasted message especially if the topic is something they are already interested in. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, let me see. All right. So um, Abraham, I saw that you raised your hand, and then we'll go back over to the handout. Well, it's just to quickly um, answer uh, Luis' question under the spaces. How do you find spaces? I think you have to, like, 
bravo and kudos to Mauricio because he definitely also chooses a spot that's relevant to the topic. Same as uh, Annie, who was on the um, Armenian Cultural Center or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so it's good to choose uh, something that's relevant, but if you can, it's still good. But I think the main uh, advice is like Gustavo, like don't be afraid of asking. Go out there and don't be shy. I mean, yeah, you can be a little nervous, but do it and approach people and ask questions. And definitely people, if, if they're not going to be able to help you, they're probably going to guide you to somebody else who can. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid. And that's the thing. You have to just do it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And ultimately, you have our support. And, you know, especially for those of you that are going to be teaching artist interns, you have our support in, in as many ways as we can provide it. Um, but, you know, we don't necessarily live in the same communities that you do. Um, we might not have the same connections that you have. So, you know, that's where we're encouraging you to find a space that you feel would be basically the best space for the content that you are hoping to teach. All of that to now say this. After your workshop, there's different ways in which you can measure your effectiveness. And this is most important for those of you that do plan on having teaching as part of your long-term uh, working artist practice. You know, as, as working artists, we're all at some point going to end up teaching a workshop or two or three or more. So as you're conducting your workshops, it's always good to check for understanding. Throughout the session, regularly ask if people are following you. Ask questions if, if they, you know, if you feel like people are not grasping the concept, ask them directly. Um, allow them to ask you questions, check for clarification. You know, those, those things are going to be super beneficial as you go through the workshop. And then, of course, after the workshop, you can always use things like um, surveys. And you can also look at people's work if they submit work to you. The one thing about surveys is that there's two forms of data that are especially useful if you're going to have a post-workshop survey. The quantitative data, you know, that's like the, the data of attendance, the demographics of the people that attended, the number of, of pieces of artwork that were completed. Those kinds of quantitative data are really valuable for funders, especially. If you're gonna be writing a grant or if you're gonna be, you know, asking for a donation, you would want to turn around and say to your funders, hey, you know, this is the number of people that your donation, you know, benefited. Qualitative data is really more for you. Qualitative data is when you use open-ended questions to basically figure out whether or not people had a good time being in your workshop. You can ask something like, what can be improved for the next time? How did the instructor do in conveying their message? You know, open-ended questions that are like short answer questions will give you really useful information for you to eventually develop a stronger uh, teaching style that's unique to you. And then again, you know, the deliverables are always gonna be another form of measuring success. You know, if you, at the end, were going to deliver, say, a zine, right? And you had everybody complete a piece of writing that was gonna be turned into a zine, the fact that you are able to create one, that's, that's a perfect example of a deliverable. That's also, I think, a good way for you to measure whether or not the people are understanding the concepts. Because if you see a uniformity in submissions, if you see that everyone is using the same technique that you were teaching in the way that you were teaching it, then you'll know that obviously they learned the, the technique that you were teaching. So that is, you know, always a good way to, to measure whether or not your, your teaching has been effective. And with that, I will leave you with one final quote. This one I personally like by Thomas Paine. The mind, once enlightened, cannot again become dark. Basically, the way that I interpret this is once you open someone's mind, once you give them a new tool, no one can ever take that away from them. They are forever going to have that tool as part of their toolkit, you know. Once aware, you can no longer be unaware. And that, I think, is really where we're headed, you know, with, with our, our lessons, our workshops. 
So, you know, again, for the people on YouTube watching this afterwards, uh, you can learn more about our programs at distillarts.org. You can also follow us on social media using at DSTL Arts. And of course, everyone else, you can always email us if you have any further questions about our workshops.